This video has been made possible through the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. Please subscribe to follow us here on YouTube and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Hi, my name's Dave Fox. Welcome to the Tuesday Tech Talk series at Charles River Museum. Today I'll be talking about the early days of vacuum cleaners. Uh, specifically, there's a number of models on display here of early vacuum cleaners that I have um, donated to the museum. They're all models that over the years I have, um, I have restored as a hobby. Um, it's been a good source of stress relief for me. Nice contrast to the high-tech work that I do since these machines are, you know, very simple and, um, and elegant and they're really um, a pleasure to, um, to work on. So I'm going to start today with a brief history of vacuum cleaners, what existed prior to the vacuum cleaner, and then, and then focus specifically on the vacuum cleaners in this particular exhibit and a little bit of history of the different vacuum cleaners. And then after that, I'll talk a little bit about the restoration process. So prior to the advent of the vacuum cleaner, um, they still needed to clean carpets. So, um, so the question is, how did they do that? Well, prior to the vacuum cleaner, the most common method was beating on the carpet. Um, if you were a housewife, you would take the carpet out, hang it over a fence or railing, take your broom and, um, you know, and beat the living daylights out of the, out of the rug. Um, I, think, I think that outlet for the housewife of taking her, out her anger on the rug was one of the reasons why couples stayed together longer um, back then. So if you were more wealthy, though, you could take your carpet into a shop to get professionally cleaned which involved basically putting the carpet through these monstrous machines that would, that would abuse the carpet and brush it and hit it in all different ways. These were, these were very large machines. Their whole purpose was to, was to beat up on the carpet to get all the dust out. Um, and there are actually quite a few patents for different kinds of carpet cleaning machines. Then around, um, 1880s, I would say, um, people started coming out with uh, designs for carpet beaters, manual handheld carpet beaters that you could use in the house. And this is an example of one of those beaters. This one is made, this particular one is made out of wicker. And this one is actually from around 1920. It was made by Zimmer and Sons of Brooklyn. But the early models that first came out in the 1880s were very similar to this. They were either you know, wicker rattan um, models like this, or they were models that had a handle along with wire, pieces of wire coming out in different forms in order to, um, you know, in, in order to basically just you know, hit on the carpet and get all the dust out. So, so, that was, so that was the way of cleaning the carpet back then. As early as 1858, a man named Hiram Herrick from East Boston had patented um, carpet sweepers that were very similar to the carpet sweepers that you might use today, the, the manual handheld sweepers um, like this one. Um, but his original design wasn't very efficient and so didn't really go anywhere. And then um, in 1876, um, a man named Melville Bissell, um, who, who lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, was frustrated by all the sawdust that he, that he constantly had to clean up in his shop. So he basically invented the first modern type carpet sweeper, which looked very much like the one shown here. And it's very similar to, to even the ones that we use today. So, so Bissell uh, became very successful 
and became the dominant name in carpet sweepers. There were other companies uh, like this one. This one was made by the Milford Manufacturing Company, Milford, Ohio. Th this one's from about 1896, but all these carpet sweepers were, were very s similar in design. Right? They, all, they all had the rolling wheels which powered a brush in the middle, which would, which would brush the dirt into one of these two trays depending upon which direction the sweeper was going. In fact, the, the, Bissell, the Bissell model became so dominant that um, in um, Queen Victoria at the time became a huge fan. And, you know, as they would say back then, she insisted that her carpets get Bissled um, every week. So they weren't swept or they were, they were Bissled. Um, and in fact, this particular model by this company is, happens to be called the Victoria in honor of Queen Victoria, who was known to be um, a huge fan of these sweeping devices. In 1889, um, Melville Bissell uh, passed away and his wife actually took over the company as CEO, his wife Anna. And she is in fact the first female CEO in the US. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Bissell name. They survive until today. They still make carpet sweepers. But in addition to that, they also make um, you know, vacuum cleaners and even robotic vacuum cleaners. So, so they were a big success story, basically coming into business at, in 1876 and lasting all the way until today. That's pretty much the pre uh, vacuum cleaner history. Now, as far as vacuum cleaners themselves go, the first, the first real vacuum cleaner is credited to a man named Cecil Booth from England who invented this machine called the Puffing Billy. Now, the Puffing Billy was a large, monstrous machine that, that was so big it had to be pulled by, uh, in a wagon by a team of horses. And the, um, the original one was powered by a, a five horsepower piston pump engine and made a lot of noise. Now, it was, at the time, it was very expensive. It, well, it was a very unique experience at the time, being, being that it was the first vacuum cleaner. And it was really reserved for servicing the rich. So they would come, they, they would park, park this big monstrous vacuum cleaner outside your house, run hoses into your, into your house, and, and vacuum your house while, while this big machine was running away, as they would say, puffing billy, as it was puffing along. And frequently, this was seen as a social event. So the, you know, the lady of the household would actually invite friends of hers um, for a party while the, while the house was being cleaned in order to you know, since it was such a unique and novel experience at the time. So the first vacuum basically was, was a large um, commercial vacuum. It really wasn't until a, around 1905 when the, when the first um, manual household vacuum came onto the scene was available to the general public. So the first vacuum that I want to talk about appropriately is called the Dust Now vacuum cleaner. Now the, the dust out vacuum cleaner was invented in uh, Birmingham, England in 1905 and is considered basically, this one is considered the, the mother of all vacuum cleaners. This is basically the, the first commercial one that was available and, and the first one of its type, uh, an English vacuum cleaner. The way, the way this particular model worked is this, it, use, it uses the dual uh, bellows system such that when you move back and forth, you get continuous suction. Um, the, the bellows alternate in terms of which one, which one is providing the suction. And the inlet for the hose is, um, is right down here. So I don't know if you can hear, but you kind of hear the suction that's producing. 
you know, actually, actually fairly decent suction. Now the way, the way this was typically used is this was, this was what they refer to as basically a two person operation vacuum cleaner, which was true for many of the early vacuum cleaners. And so they provided a, a little, they provided a little foot stand here in order to keep the vacuum cleaner stable. And one person would pump back and forth, usually, usually one of the children of the household. And then the hose would come out the other side on the intake while the, um, while the housewife would vacuum. Now this particular model also has a number of holes on top here for, different, for storing different attachments um, for the vacuum cleaner. So, so this was actually a high-end, you know, very nice model. Just like, just like most models of the time, these all actually had dust bags as well. So you could, you could take these out, empty the dust bags, put them back in. So, so, so this particular kind of model became a fairly typical design for the time. Actually, it worked, it worked surprisingly well. Now, one thing to note about these early vacuum cleaners is that obviously compared to the vacuum cleaners of today, since they used a bellows system, it didn't provide a strong amount of suction. So what their primary goal really was, was to, um, was to remove dust as opposed to removing other objects um, that might be on the carpet. So as a result, the hoses that they used were, were very, um, you know, very small diameter, maybe um, some of them as small as half an inch diameter because all they were expecting to suck through the hose was dust and the smaller uh, hose size also provided for um, more suction and higher velocity through the hose, which, which they needed because of the relatively inefficient um, operation of the bellows. So this next model that I wanna show you was invented by a man named Oliver Kendall who was born in Boylestown, Massachusetts in 1848. And he actually had a business in Worcester, Massachusetts um, called Oliver Kendall and Sons. And they were actually an HVAC company. So um, like many of the vacuum cleaners, one thing to understand is that at the time, this was basically a brand new technology. So you, ha you had inventors nearly crawling out of the woodwork to try their hand at inventing the next greatest vacuum cleaner. And that's exactly what Oliver, Oliver Wendell did. So this particular model was his first try at inventing the vacuum cleaner. Uh, this, one is, this one's very rare. Uh, his more popular model called the new simplex, simplex vacuum cleaner, which had both a manual and a motorized version, uh, was much more popular. Now, part of the reason why this one wasn't so popular is that it, it didn't work very well. <laughs> the way this particular vacuum cleaner is constructed is it's actually all steel on the inside, which is kind of hard to kind of hard to see, but you can hear it. The entire the, the entire inside chamber is basically flat steel, and it's all surrounded by wood, so kind of expensive to um, to build. And then basically the way this works is there are two there are two open there are two open rectangular chambers on each side. These rods here are attached to pistons, rectangular pistons, and the pistons were basically um, outlined with leather. And then um, beeswax was applied to the leather to, the leather to try to provide a better uh, seal against the metal inside. So, ba so basically it relied it relied on those, on those pistons producing suction, but as it turns out, that design didn't work very well because there was a lot of air that still leaked past the piston, um, so, which, which was one of the reasons why this had to be redesigned and wasn't 
um, wasn't overly successful. But like I said, his, um, his next attempt called the new simplex vacuum cleaner was much more, um, much more popular and much more successful. And as is the case with a lot of these vacuum cleaners, as you can see here, they put their personal touch on here. It has the initials KS for, for Kendall Simplex, as well as the initials on the, on the rubber foot mat. And I don't know if you can get a close up of this, but they also have their own tag complete with the company name and, um, and model. And once again, just like the just like the other vacuum cleaners that I've been showing, this was a two-person model. So this one has a nice footrest again for stability. And again, one person would sit here and rock back and forth to produce the suction while, while the lady of the house would vacuum. Now, this one I'm guessing I won't be able to hear any suction on because it's, like I said, it doesn't work particularly well, but not to mention that the squeaking sort of overpowers any noise, so uh, you, you, can't really, you can't really hear anything, but, um, but, you know, the model itself is attractive, which is one of the things that um, I like about restoring these old vacuum cleaners is that, you know, they were basically made out of wood, metal, uh, rubber sometimes, and, um, you know, they clean up nicely and I think they present beautifully um, as showpieces. So the next model that I want to share with you is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's one of my favorites because of the design and appearance of it, um, as well as the history. So this particular model was invented by a man named Jacob Luden from Reading, Pennsylvania in 1910. Now, the name Luden sounds familiar to you? Well, uh, Jacob had a brother named William who um, in, the, in the 1880s started a confectionery business out of his mother's kitchen in the family jewelry shop. And um, from there, he, he came up with the idea of adding menthol to the candy to help suppress coughs. And so his cough drop became very famous and the looting cough drop, it, many people are familiar with even till today. So, 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 the, so the cough drop was invented by Jacob Luden's uh, brother, William. Now, uh, Jacob Luden himself was primarily a, ju a jeweler. His family migrated from, uh, they were Dutch, they migrated to Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, the primary family business was the jewelry shop and, um, and watch repair, which was Jacob's primary um, career. But on the side, he was an inventor. Um, besides the vacuum cleaner, he invented other devices, such as um, a window so sash, as well as, uh, kind of railroad tie. So, so, he, so he, dabbled, he dabbled in these kind of devices on the side. This particular model though is quite unique and attractive. So the suction chamber is located down on the bottom here. And like some of the, like the Regina model, it has a large leather um, bellows that it uses in the center. But unlike the, um, the Regina model. The valves on this are designed such that the bellows can provide suction in either direction. So it only needs a single bellows. And um, you can hear as it goes back and forth, it, it provides suction in either direction. And, and then mount, mounted above it is the, is the dust collection chamber. And another unique feature of this particular design is they included this glass bulb on top. The, the hose inlet is here, and then from there it points up into the bulb such that you can see the material that's being sucked off your carpet. 
I don't know if that particular feature was useful or if it was just more of a uh, neat thing to have at the time, but, um, but he added that into the design. As far as patents go, um, one, of, one of the things that Jacob patented besides this, he actually patented this ball design on top in, or, in order to see um, the material you were suctioning. He also had a patent for storing the, um, the utility, the um, attachments under the, under the platform here. So all this really was, was the pieces of leather mounted under the platform for storing, um, for storing your, your um, attachments. Bring the model down here. As, as I think you could hear before, this particular model um, provides a decent amount of suction. You can, you can hear the valves working and the, and the suction that it provides. And once again, uh, this required two-person two operation in, in general, one person to do the vacuuming and the other person to, um, to operate it. The, the other thing I'd point out with this model, which is kind of interesting, is that even the, even the L brackets down here are, are patented. Now, they're not, they're not patented by um, Jacob Luden himself. They were patented around the same time by another individual. And what's unique about the bracket is it's actually, it was actually designed as a shelf bracket. And um, Jacob used it in this particular case to support the vacuum cleaner. But what was unique about the shelf bracket is it was one of the first brackets made out of pressed steel. Prior to that time, all brackets like that were made out of cast iron. So, so the concept of manufacturing, um, the, you know, manufacturing pieces like brackets with rolled steel was brand new at the time. This next particular model um, is very unique because of the rarity of it. Um, I've, I've, only, I've only seen this one model anywhere, and there's absolutely no information about who made this particular model or exactly how old it is. For all I know, this could be a prototype that was never really sold. But like I said, I can't tell you too much about it, it um, other, other than it's from the same time period, uh, probably around 1910. Uh, the construction and the hardware is in keeping with that time frame. And it's, ac it's actually fairly well made. Now this particular model, let me see if I can get this open. Access to the suction chamber was through, was through the top. There is one very unique thing about this vacuum cleaner. Unlike other vacuum cleaners of the time, uh, this particular vacuum cleaner doesn't use a dust bag. I think I can tilt this to show, tilt this to show you the inside of it. So basically what they, what they did is instead of using a dust bag, they used a series of baffles that were designed to make the dust settle at the bottom of the chamber without being exhausted out the exhaust side. It just used gravity to force the dust down to the bottom of the chamber where it would hopefully sit without, um, without blowing back out the exhaust. Now, in practice, I don't know how well that worked. I'm sure they still got some dust returning into the air, but it was definitely, definitely a, a novel design for that time. The suction chamber itself is very similar to other models that I showed. For this particular model, the suction chamber was basically a, a canister type container, very similar to the other ones that used a single large piece of leather in the middle. And if I can move this back and forth, you can see it used the back and forth motion to drive the, to drive the leather back and forth and, and generate the suction. So, but like I said, one of the fascinating things about this is I don't think it really, I don't think, I, I highly doubt that this, this ever really sold. Um, it was probably largely a, um, 
a prototype model, and they probably never um, never really set up the the full manufacturing for it. So this this one is a is a very rare model, but as you can hear, it does it does work fairly well. You can hear the suction that it produces. Like the other models, it'll, it'll produce suction on strokes in either direction. So I think one thing this demonstrates is the fact that at the time, there were a lot of people trying to make their own version of a vacuum cleaner. And not all of them were successful. And this is an example of one of those models that, one of those many types of models that just didn't quite make it. The next model that I'd like to discuss is called the Leisure vacuum cleaner, spelled L-E-A-S-U-R-E. -E. From the research that I've done, it sounded, sounds like everyone called it the Leisure vacuum cleaner. They didn't realize that Leisure was the name of the, um, of the company. So for now, I'll just call it the Leisure vacuum cleaner. This particular model is, as you can see, extremely unique and different from the other models that we've shown. And it's actually one of the highly sought after models for the very few people who actually do collect vacuum cleaners. And as you can see, what makes this model unique is that it's powered by its wheels when you roll it. This vacuum cleaner is quite complex. It has two um, suction chambers, each with their own leather bellows. And then on top of that, each of the leather bellows provides suction in either direction. So therefore, as you're operating it, you, bas you basically get continuous suction um, from both bellows in, in um, both directions. And then, I don't know if you can see from there, but this chamber is connected through a pipe underneath to this other chamber, which is then connected to the, to the bottom of the, um, of the collection chamber here, which has its dust bag um, built into the chamber. As you can see, uh, the, way this, the way this works is it has an adjustable uh, roller underneath. The roller would keep the suction um, nozzle from actually scraping across the ground. So, so, so you relied on that to keep, the, to keep the proper height. And then as you, as you rolled it in either direction, it would, it would provide suction. I'm gonna just prop it up a little bit such that the wheel doesn't make any sound. I'm kind of hard to hear the suction, but. But it's kind of, it's kind of neat to see in operation. It kind of reminds you of, of, uh, of the of train axles as the train's going along, uh, working in either direction. Now in the, in the top here, you have these caps that come off. These are the out, output valves for each of the for each each of the chambers. It's just basically a, a piece of leather with a with a metal washer that weighs it down um, in order to keep good contact against the um, against the hole um, in, in the top of the chamber here. Another very unique thing about this design is aside from Aside from being operated like, um, like a rolling vacuum cleaner, it was also designed to be used as a stationary vacuum cleaner. The other, um, the other way that this particular device was designed to work is you could, you could lock the handles down into this down position, which would raise the wheels up off the ground. Then up here, you have this metal stopper that comes out of here, and you have a valve here that turns to redirect the air input to here. So therefore, you could then attach a hose onto this inlet, and there was a separate handle that would attach to the wheel, and one person could basically crank the wheel while the other person was vacuuming in order to use it as a stationary vacuum. So, that was one sort of clever, unique um, aspect of this design as well. 
So this next vacuum cleaner that I'm going to show you is called the Agen vacuum cleaner, invented by Frank Agen in 1907. He was from Ludlow, Vermont. Now, by trade, uh, Frank Agen was, tra was trained in the mills at the time. Um, he started and ran a very successful shoddy mill business up in Vermont. Um, along the way, he also started a telephone company. And um, he also ran for governor of Vermont, actually lieutenant governor in 1902. And he was narrowly defeated in what the New York Times called at the time the, the, the hottest race ever um, in Vermont. Unfortunately, Frank tried once again in 1920 to run for governor, but he lost that time as well. But he did invent the Agen vacuum cleaner along the way. This particular model is, is extremely unique. Unlike the other models, um, this, is, this, is what, this is the only model uh, that I have that uses an impeller. So all the suction is provided by an impeller that's housed within this chamber here. Uh, this, this connection here provides the, the inlet hose. And then here is an outlet connection. So this particular model had no dust bag either. So there were two particular options that Frank Agen provided for getting rid of the dust. One was a device that came off the side and went into a glass bottle that was maybe half full of water. And so the pipe, and so the pipe would go, the pipe would go down into the water. So as you ran it, the dust was blown into the water and the water would prevent the dust from going everywhere. The dust would dissolve in the water and then when the water got dirty enough, you emptied out the water and refilled it. The other possibility was to run a long hose from here out your window, <laughs> such, that the, such that the dust goes, uh, goes out of the house. And, and so that was another um, option that he provided. Now, this particular model is extremely rare. This is, the, this is the first model that he invented. Now, one problem with this particular model is that, as you can see here, there's a pretty extreme um, ratio in, in the radius of this wheel versus this wheel. And then you have a similar issue on, on this side, which, um, which, which ultimately powers the impeller. So because of those large ratios, the belts had to be very tight and to provide enough traction and any, any slipping would be, would be problematic. So what Frank Agen did is he redesigned this, the same basic design, but added a two pulley system in order, in order to solve that issue. And, um, and that worked much better. Now, as you can see here, he built he built the initials of the company into the design. This is um, um, AVC for the Agen Vacuum Cleaner Company, uh, built, built into this wheel. So for this operation, again, a two-person model. Uh, one person would crank the machine while the other person would vacuum. And so let's see, these pulleys often slip, but let's see if we can get it running here. So that whining noise that you hear is the impeller uh, running inside here. And it actually does generate quite a bit of suction. So this is, this is the input side. So I'll get, this, I'll get this cranking and then you can put it up against the intake. Yes, it does. Yeah, odd, oddly enough with these machines, the more they suck, the better they are. So that is, that is the um, Agen vacuum cleaner. And um, very lucky to find this model, because like I said, it's hard enough to find any models. And this one was, a, was the first model that didn't work as well 
and so and so is definitely rarer. So this next vacuum cleaner is one of my personal favorites, called the Cotton Vacuum Cleaner, invented by Herman Cotton from New Jersey City, New Jersey, back in 1910. Um, you can see on the surface. He has his name um, imprinted on, um, on this non-slip material. So um, Her Herman Cotton immigrated from Germany back in around 1917. And um, he was a trained stone carver at the time. And among other inventions, he invented a number of pneumatic stone carving tools. And since he was into pneumatics, at the time that the vacuum cleaner sensation started taking off, he thought he'd try his hand at inventing a vacuum cleaner. And he came up with this extremely unique design uh, right here, which um, is you know, very, very rare, but highly desirable design uh, because of its uniqueness. So the idea with this design is that the housewife would actually stand on this and rock back and forth in order to produce the suction. And um, you can see there's a, there's a bellows underneath, um, underneath each side to, to, to provide the operation. And if you look, if you look underneath, you'll see, you know, it's very, very well made. So that you can see these air chambers on um, uh, running on both sides underneath, along with uh, a simple piece of leather on both sides to act um, as a valve. And then the dust collection chamber was, um, was underneath. And this, this, have the, this has a camming mechanism that allows you to, to remove the dust chamber, which, which has a dust bag inside of it. Um, and it also has a nice set of instructions <laughs> print on the dust bag as well. And I'll, I'll be discussing that in a little bit um, during our restoration uh, section. As I said, this particular model is, is a lot of fun. I will try to demo this for you in action. Again, the, in this case, the vacuum hose attaches to the inlet down here. And you would you would mount this device and rock back and forth as you, um, as you vacuum your carpet. And I suppose get some exercise, although at the time I don't know if that was really one of the advertising points, since I'm sure the housewives got plenty of exercise hauling water and doing other chores in the house, but this particular design was also designed to, as you move from place to place, you would just basically move it with your foot as it had, it came with these metal sliders, which I think is part of the patent as well, in order, in order to allow it to more easily um, slide across the carpet. The next model that I'd like to show you is a model by the Regina Vacuum Cleaner Company. Um, this, is, this is actually the first vacuum cleaner that I restored. How I got into this was I was in an antique shop and I saw it sitting on the floor. Um, it was marked way down because no one, nobody, wanted it, nobody wanted it. And I was playing with it, and I noticed that even, even in its unrestored state, I noticed that if I put my finger up to the intake, I could still feel a little bit of suction, which I thought was, you know, which I thought was impressive given the age of the machine. And so, um, and so I purchased it and took it upon myself to, to restore it to working order. And from there on out, I just started to acquire other different models of vacuum cleaner. Now, this particular model was um, patented in 1907, like I said, by the Regina Company. Uh, that name might sound familiar to you because Regina actually still makes vacuum cleaners today. Now, prior to making vacuum cleaners, Regina was, was actually a fairly large company. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar, um, 
back in the, in the late 19th century, Regina made music boxes. They, they made a lot, of, a lot of those boxes that used the metal discs um, in, order, in order to play music. And that's basically what they were famous for. But what happened in the turn of the century is there were, there were a lot of innovations at that time. One of the big innovations of the time was the phonograph. So what happened is instead of buying music boxes for their music, people started buying phon phonographs and the, their Regina's music box business started to decline. So therefore, at the, at the time, the vacuum cleaner was the latest and greatest uh, technology whiz-bang device. And, and so they thought it would be good for them to diversify and they started building vacuum cleaners. And in fact, from the vacuum cleaner perspective, I think Regina is really the only manufacturer of these early vacuum cleaners that continue to survive um, until, until today as a, as a vacuum cleaner company. This particular one is another cl classic design from back then. It's, it's more of a canister model. So the way, the way this particular model works is there are, th there are large leather diaphragms inside each of these chambers. And these rods on either side basically are attached to the middle of that diaphragm. So as you rock back and forth, alternately um, each diaphragm is producing suction into the center uh, suction chamber, again, uh, to give you continuous um, suction. And like, like, like the other model, this one, in a similar fashion, has, has its own internal dust bag. And like, and, and like the previous model we showed, this one was also, also required a two-person operation. So, so again, one, one person would stand here uh, providing, providing the suction while the, um, while the housewife would, um, would, be, would be cleaning. And let's see if we can, just see if I could hear the suction on this one. So you can, you can hear that the suction it produces is actually, it's actually not too bad and it's plenty adequate, again, if you're, if you're only vacuuming something like dust from, the, uh, from your carpet. So the next vacuum cleaner that I want to show you isn't really from the same era that I've been presenting. The era that I've been presenting is more from say 1905 to 1913 or so, um, prior to the electric vacuum making a big splash. But what's unique about this one is that um, after the electric vacuum cleaner came out, uh, this particular company, uh, the, the Vital Manufacturing Company, decided to come out with a model and advertise that the no need for electricity was a benefit <laughs> in this particular case. Now this one is from the 1920s, so it wasn't that long after the electric models came out. But what's really unique about this design is that it does develop a decent amount of suction uh, just by its own power. It uses an impeller to provide the suction and uses a fairly sophisticated gearing section um, in, order, in order to um, get the impeller spinning fast. So I'll just demo the operation here. Now, as you can see from the bag inflating, it does provide a decent amount of suction here um, under its own power. So next we're gonna take the cover off of this and just, just to show you what's inside. All right, so, so this is the vacuum cleaner with the cover off. And you can see, you can see the gearing mechanism at work here. 
so on this particular side has a gear which drives this assembly um, with, a, with a sort of transaxle here that drives down to the impeller. Now, the impeller itself, at the moment, you can't really see it without taking off the bottom cover, but, but it, 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 does, it does also have a set of brushes underneath as well. Show you the operation here with the, with the cover off. So, very unique uh, mechanical design that actually works fairly well. So, it's difficult to find a lot of these vacuum cleaners today because, as you imagine, the manual vacuum cleaners were replaced by the electric vacuum cleaners, and so after that they were pretty much junk, and in most cases they were thrown out. In the rare case where you can still find them, it was usually a pack rat who couldn't bear to throw it out and put it in a barn somewhere and left it there for years and years. But you can actually identify a number of the cleaners in this picture. For example, um, these, models in, these models right up front here, this one right here, is a Regina, just like one of these, right next to it. And you can see that there's, there's a few of the Reginas in here. There's one there, and one there, and one here. There, there was a poor man's version of the vacuum cleaner. There were a number of stick models and the way the stick models worked was typically with a single plunger where you would, you would basically pull the plunger back and forth. It wasn't very effective, but they were cheap, and so they sold well. And so, for example, these models here are all classic um, plunger models where you can see, for example, these models here, they have handles on top. And these, these are the handles where you would pull the plunger out from the stick vacuum in order, in order to create the suction. And you'll also see in the picture down at the bottom, this domestic one and this one next to it are an example of the vacuum sweeper models. We showed you one vacuum sweeper model early that, that combined a sweeper with a built-in bellows. These are all the sweeper models. And, and in the bottom here are some of the classic sweepers, which are just sweepers only without the vacuum built in. This particular one up here is interesting because this is another, this is another canister model, very similar to the Regina, but by a different manufacturer, but very similar design. And you can actually see the handle pointing up here that's used for, for driving this, this particular canister model. This particular picture was taken by a, sales, a vacuum cleaner salesman who over the years um, took trade-ins for the vacuum cleaners that he sold. And so he got quite a number of trade-ins. And in this particular picture, he piled them all together. And before he lit them all on fire, he, um, he, he took a picture of the pile of vacuum cleaners. So all the vacuum cleaners in this, in this particular picture met their demise. All right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the restoration process. So when it comes to antiques and restoration, um, there are a lot of rules that some people follow. For example, if you were restoring a piece of furniture, right, the general um, rule of thumb is that you don't touch the finish. You know, you just clean it lightly. But in the case of vacuum cleaners, my philosophy is very much like the philosophy that someone would use when restoring an antique car. By that, I mean you want to restore it to its original condition and its original grandeur. And my goal is to get it back in its original operating condition. Because at least to me, if you look at a piece like this, which is a unrestored version of this particular vacuum cleaner, it's not particularly attractive. As you can see here, right, the restored, the restored wood and the restored finish makes this model quite attractive, whereas you know, unrestored version of it is is actually rather ugly. So like I said, the, the, the basic goal is to, is to restore it to 
new condition. So in order to do that, basically you need to take the machine completely apart. And that's because you, re you really want to um, replace parts that dry out or, or are worn. For example, in this case, there are leather, be leather bellows that are encased in here that really, um, that really need to get replaced. So therefore, this all needs to be taken apart. You know, this needs to be dismounted from the wood such that you can properly finish the wood. These cast iron parts here really need to be completely taken apart uh, so you can clean them as well. A, in a typical restoration, if you use this as an example, after getting it all apart, uh, the wood like this would get completely sanded down with all, with all the old finish stripped off such that you get, to, you get down to the original wood. And then, and then the wood gets um, refinished. Now, when I refinish the wood, one of my goals is to refinish it to the original color. But as you can see, um, had, you know, from this, how do you know what the original color really was? Well, what I found is that you can usually always um, find a piece that hasn't been exposed to the elements. For example, um, underneath the canister here where it meets with this piece of wood is a good location where it might have been sealed enough to really get a good idea as to what the um, original stain color was because it's blocked it from external light and other elements. You can, you can also frequently, if you, if you take off a piece like this, you can also frequently get an idea of what the original stain looks like. And what I found very frequently is that which I guess is not unexpected, is that the original stain color is typically much redder than the piece, than the piece looks once it's aged. And the reason for that is because the, red, the, the redness breaks down with the sunlight, and so, and so that, gets, that gets bleached out of the color. This one wasn't as red, but this is true to the original color. Like I said, I was able, on this I was able to find pieces that were basically um, unexposed, such that I could, I could really determine what the original color was. Another aspect of a restoration of a piece like this is the, is the cast iron. The paint that they used back then on the cast iron wasn't particularly formulated for protecting, protecting the cast iron, and so frequently what you find is that even with the paint on, you get a lot of rust even underneath the paint because the paint still allows moisture to seep in. So therefore, what, what I would do with the cast iron is, besides stripping the paint off, I actually use a Dremel to, 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 to grind down the, the cast iron. And what you'll find is that as you're grinding it, there, there, there's a stippled layer that, that's actually partially corroded. And you can see the red oxide coming off as you're grinding that layer. So my goal is to, is to get completely rid of that layer such that the newer formulation paint that gets applied can properly protect, um, protect the metal. Because part of the goal of the restoration is to, is to make, the pe make the piece last as long as possible. And as part of that, one advantage you have is to use modern formulations, modern paints, in order to help make that happen. But that will only work if you, if you take the time to refinish it properly. Another aspect of a piece like this requires restoration is, as you can see, very, fre very frequently you will have dents in the material. Now, those dents, for the most part, can be hammered out, but even after you hammer them out, uh, like metal working on a car, you'll find that you still have, you still have some ripple in the metal. So therefore, um, in those occasions, I will use Bondo um, in, in, order to, in order to smooth out those ripples, rippled sections to give it a nice smooth finish. Another, another aspect of restoration includes replacing rubber pieces. A piece like this would originally have um, a rubber gasket around the outside, but a lot of the time those, those rubber gaskets um, dry out and, and, and break apart. So, so those always have to get replaced as well. And that's relatively easy to do with, um, with a piece of cutting it out of a piece of sheet rubber.
one of the tougher parts of restorations is restoring the label. More often than not, the original labeling and painting needs to get replaced. Now this one's actually in fairly decent shape, the, the printing on this, so, so the decision would have to be made at the time that, that, it, that it was remodeled and cleaned up to see, to see how, how the original graphics hold up. Luckily, using modern techniques, um, you, you can restore the graphics. Now, again, one of the key goals here when you're restoring this is you want, is you want, you want these graphics to live for a long time, right? You don't want a situation where, where, where the, the paint for the graphics has deteriorated over the time to the point where it's just gonna continue to get worse and flake off because by that time you've lost the original graphics and you won't get them back. So what I will, what I will, will frequently do is basically make a, either a photo or a scan of the original graphics, take it into Photoshop to clean it up, and then use, use a cutting plotter to make a vinyl stencils and then, um, and then repaint the, the graphics onto the, um, onto the uh, vacuum cleaner. That, that's not an easy process, it takes a while. The photoshopping takes a while to clean it up and it does take a while to, to, um, to create the stencils, but um, it's all part of the process. In fact, this particular, this particular model was, was one where I did have to re-stencil it. And as you can see, this original, this, this paint here, although, although it shows up as silver, the original paint on here was, was, was actually this color gold. But the gold over top frequently flaked off. This one still has a little bit of it left that you can see in spots, but, but for the most part, it's flaked off. Talking about labeling, here, here's an example of one that I'm restoring. It's, a, it's another British vacuum cleaner called the Baby Daisy. The model looks very much, very much like this. It's pretty much a copy of this one, um, this particular design. One technique that you'll see used frequently with these antique vacuum cleaners is that they frequently print on top of basically foil in order to make, in order to make the labels look more attractive. In order to really do that, what they, what they did is they, had, they basically had stamps that they made and they would stamp the design onto the foil. Now, making your own stamp these days is kind of is difficult to do. So as an alternative, what I do is I will use foil printer paper. And after, after cleaning up the design in Photoshop again, I print directly onto the printer paper, um, cut it out, and then apply it onto the surface. The goal here is to really not lose any of the original text um, and, and to restore it such that for years to come, people can read the original label as well as enjoy the original artwork. Another example of that, this particular label on here is a reproduction that I made from the original. The original one, the paper was highly deteriorated. It was very brittle dried out and browning. It had, it had a lot of brown spots on it and some rips. And it was, it, and it was really, in, um, really in, in poor shape. So what I, what I had to do is, with the original la label, I applied a number of layers of Mod Podge on top of the layer in order to hold the paper together. Once I had enough layers, I was able to soak it and peel it off such that, such that the, the graphics were, whatever graphics were left were still intact. And from there, I was able to um, get it scanned and then take it, take it into Photoshop for, um, for cleanup and restoration in Photoshop and then reprint the label. You know, one of the great things about preserving a label like this is if you read through it, this, this gives you the directions of operation. And what's really great about this is it, it tells you the proper way to mount the vacuum cleaner and the proper way to rock back and forth. Part of the instructions say, in mounting the cleaner, the right foot should be placed on the end in front of the operator and the left foot at the extreme front end by throwing the weight of the body on the left foot and slightly raising the heel on the right foot, 
an easy seesaw motion is obtained without any great exertion on the part of the operator. In this way, the operator can stand perfectly straight and rigid without even bending the knee. So, <laughs> so it's, just, it's just great how this, how this provides you the detailed instructions. And they, and they even contain a nice graphic of a lady um, in, in full housewife dress standing on top of this vacuum cleaner and rocking back and forth. So, so that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons why you really want to preserve these labels such that you can continue to enjoy them and the original directions aren't lost. As part of the restoration process, the leather always needs to get replaced. If you look at the original pictures of this particular one, which we can show you, um, the, the bellows are, are, are they're mostly missing, which is, which is pieces of them hanging there because they've been all dried out. On this particular one, luckily, I was, I was able to restore the, restore the surface of it. This surface was actually, was actually in fairly poor condition originally. It was, it, it was flaking apart, but I really wanted to preserve the original pad. So once again, in this case, I, I used Mod Podge as well and put multiple layers of Mod Podge on it in order to help hold it together. And then the other thing I did to, to help preserve it is on the back of this, I have a thin piece of sheet metal, which wasn't there originally. Um, glued to the back of this to hold this all together. To me, it was important to keep the original pad, especially since it, especially since it had this printing on it from the, from the manufacturer. And in this case, I was able to, you know, I was able to do that and, and make, still make the final product durable you know, while preserving the original material. With these vacuum cleaners, you, you rarely find the hoses with them. And here's the reason for that. <laughs> Here's one of the original hoses that I managed to get with one of the pieces. And as you can see, the original construction of the hoses tends to be um, cloth uh, wrapped around rubber. And so what happens over time is the rubber, the rub the rubber inside dries out, uh, the cloth dry rots, and you wind up with um, a bunch of cracked hose. So, it's difficult to preserve the original hose, but at least this piece, with this piece, you can, you can see basically what the hoses looked like back, back in those days and, and just, how, just how thin they were for, for, for carrying the dust compared to the, um, you know, the diameter of the hoses that we use in modern vacuum cleaners. So I hope you've all enjoyed this presentation of our tech talk on vacuum cleaners. Um, just about all the models that I showed you today are at display in the museum, once you can get back into the museum. <laughs> and um, if you have any questions on, on what you've seen during this presentation, we will have the Q&A session right after this presentation where you can um, ask whatever questions you came up with while watching the presentation. So um, thanks again and we Hope one day to see you at the Charles River Museum and such that you can see these vacuum cleaners in person. Welcome everybody. We're gonna to go to uh, live Q&A in a few moments, but we do have one pre-recorded question that um, we couldn't resist asking during the filming process. So uh, please hold, and now's a great time for you to enter any questions that you've got in the chat stream. We'll see you in a few minutes. So the, I think the first question for the Q&A session actually came from the filming crew here, which was, the um, question was, what got me interested in restoring vacuum cleaners? I think as, as I got older, I took more of an interest in antiques in general, uh, just because I think they bring you back to a simpler time. 
in particular, I've always been interested in what they call mantiques. Now, mantiques are, tend to be those old mechanical devices that women consider as ugly, but guys typically consider to be really cool, which, which tend to include um, a lot of mechanical devices, such as, the, um, such as the vacuum cleaner. Some of the other things that I restore are, um, are old music boxes, some clocks, Basically, any number of things with mechanical motion uh, I enjoy restoring. But in particular, um, I think I'm, I mentioned earlier that the Regina was the first one that I restored. I, I saw one in an antique shop and was, and was fascinated that it still sort of seemed to work. So I took it home and my goal was to clean it up, get it back to original working condition, because really what I wanted to see was just how well it actually worked. You know, you know, once it was restored back to the original operating condition, I, I wanted to really understand how well these things actually work. And so I restored my first one and then started doing research into other types of vacuum cleaners and found a number of other vacuum cleaners either on eBay or other online auction sites or estate sales, um, any, any number of places. Basically, I was looking for aesthetic models where I enjoyed the design and I thought would look really nice restored. And I would purchase them and work on restoring them as a hobby in my spare time to, um, to sort of take a break from the high-tech world, if you will. It's certainly gratifying when you're done to have, uh, to have something that looks what I think to be uh, very aesthetic and is, and is still functional as well. Through doing this, you, you preserve a piece of history for, um, for other generations to come. So, you know, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed this process. Uh, I've haven't been through something quite like this before where uh, someone has taken us on a really deep dive into an exhibit. All of these, uh, most of these vacuum cleaners have been in cases at the museum for about six months and, uh, you know, pre-pandemic actually. And we, um, I didn't really understand them. But uh, Dave has taken us on a journey uh, with a, a tremendous number of, of insights um, I understand the superiority of impeller technology, and I find that it relates really well to uh, the uh, turbines that were great improvements in the um, water power days over the water wheels. So oh. it's, a, it's a kind of a, a similar sort of a parallelism in uh, technology. Um, I also really appreciate, I mean, these are over a century old, all of these things that are around us right now. and. Um, there was a great appreciation for high style, I think, in uh, consumer product oh, definitely. Uh, um, yeah. design and, and, and manufacture. Yeah, I mean, it, you, it, and you, you, you didn't have plastic back then, right? You, you were sort of forced to use wood and metal and other materials that really s survive over time. So, yeah. um, you know, they are really quite attractive. They are. I, in the chat, um, one of our viewers asked that we uh, repeat the intro since I pressed the wrong button and um, <laughs> we were muted at the outset. And all that really was was setting up uh, your expectations for what was going to happen this evening. So you didn't really miss very much by uh, missing the intro. What, you, what the intro was about is what is happening now. Um, here's a question from the audience. Okay. Have you ever found something interesting still inside the vacuum that was sucked up by a previous user? Oh, um, interesting question. Um, in, in general, no. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's, I think it's definitely been a fantasy of mine sometimes when you get any of these to, to, to find a treat. But typically the only treat you find is, um, is old dust. I think a few times I found maybe um, old pins. I did, find a, I did actually find an old stamp once. Um, I don't know what the value was of that particular stamp. But um, most of these vacuum cleaners, as I, sh as I showed before, did have dust bags. So 
Uh, so typically there wouldn't be anything hidden, right? Because the user would just take out the dust bag, empty it out, and that was that. But um, interesting question, thank you. Um, have you ever been tempted to keep one, uh, perhaps one of the sweepers at home for any regular personal use? Um, actually, yes. I mean, I, I had this um, on the main floor of my house in my family room for quite a while because I really, um, I really like the way it works. It actually works quite well and is a novel design and will and does actually pick up, um, does actually do a decent job of picking up dirt. So it's just, um, it's just fun to operate. Now the rest of my family hates it when I operate it because of all the noise that it makes. <laughs> but, um, so I can't do it too often, but <laughs> it is a lot of fun. Yeah, I, th I think it's beautiful. And I love the retro aspect. In oh. other words, oh, this yeah. was designed and built after uh, electric vacuums were a thing. And, um, Frankly, I find it very elegant. Oh yeah, yeah, it was very, very well made mechanically, and um, was able to get it back, back and running in its original condition. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of fun. Thanks. So, we have so um, I have a few questions for you of my own that have come to mind as I've been going through the process sure. of filming you and editing it. And I feel like I've gotten to know your work and um, your process really well. My curiosity is, now that I know how long it takes to edit video, <laughs> how long does it take to restore a vacuum cleaner? Um, it's a good question. It's hard to say. Uh, um, most of these restorations I did while I was still working. So most of the time I put in would be on the weekend. Uh, Sometimes on weeknights, I would put, um, I would put time in, but it does take, um, it actually does take quite a while because like I said, for any one of these vacuums, you're really taking the whole thing apart and every single little piece, including any screws or bolts or anything have to be, you know, get cleaned thoroughly, uh, you know, get the rust removed. Um, there's a lot of preparation work in order to prepare the surface for painting, mm -hmm. you know, st stripping off the old, stripping off the old paint, um, you know, getting rid of any rust in a lot of cases, um, repairing the surface mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the graphics themselves can take, can take quite a bit of time. So it does, it does take, it does take, um, quite a bit of time, but you know, just like any hobby, it's a, you know, it's a labor of love and. Ultimately, you, you appreciate the final product. Well, I certainly appreciate it a whole lot more. I mean, this has been a great example of uh, how someone sharing their process, letting, letting you see inside uh, what it takes to bring something back like this, uh, it m makes you see it afresh. And I really find them beautiful and, and fascinating. Um, what part of the restoration process or what restoration process within the whole restoration of one of these vacuums did you find most challenging? Most challenging? Um, I, think pro I think probably the most challenging part um, is, is restoring the graphics mm. because a lot of times the graphics are extremely dirty or incomplete so, so it takes a while you know using a program like Photoshop to properly clean that up Mm -hmm. and, um, and repair it. And then after that, you have to, you have to figure out how to, um, you know, how to get it back on the piece, whether it's through stencil or through more of a, uh, of a decal process, depending upon um, what was done with the original piece. So that's probably, that's probably um, part of the more uh, difficult part. Uh, certainly the more time consuming piece of it is just taking everything apart and, and restoring all the little mm -hmm. um, bits and pieces. Makes you probably discipline yourself to work on one at a time because you can yeah. mix up screws Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, that's the way it goes. It's pretty much one at a time. And yeah. each, each, one, each one presents its own challenges. For instance, this particular one, luckily it had one of these, um, one of these caps um, still left on the model. Three of them were missing. Hmm. So, so, so using the original one, I, I, 
I reproduced my own um, caps in, or in order to fill it out. And so, um, you, know, you know, that's, that's quite the process because for something like this, you don't have the same machinery that they did for, for making the piece, but, um, but you know, certainly doable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think I know you to be a software guy, am I right? Uh, hardware. Hardware. Yep. Never mind, because <laughs> I know what it was. You were explaining to me that you were writing a program uh, in my retirement. In your yes. retirement, so <laughs> that duped me. I I apologize for that. Yeah, no but problem. But I was I was wondering, you know, how did you develop the hand skills necessary for doing this kind of work when you spent your career engaged in a completely different skill set? Um, I, I think I've I think I've always been hands on, starting with my um, first fixer upper house, uh, where I basically had to gut a lot of the interior of the house and redo plumbing and um, electrical and, and woodwork. But I've always, I've always enjoyed working with my hands. And, um, you know, this, you know, I get, I think something, something attracts me to, um, to being able to fix broken things. It's just, mm -hmm. I like to, I, I like to be able to repair things, get them cleaned up, get them back working. So, um, so, you know, so that's one thing that drives me to, um, to restoring all the different pieces. Well, you could teach all of us a thing or two about doing that because it would be great if we could uh, reverse the trend a bit uh, that has been of late toward uh, you know, a throwaway Throwing society. Throwing everything out. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We have more questions from the, the stream. Great. Uh, where do you find the leather to restore the bellows? And what's involved in shaping the leather to its new use? Good question. So, um, luckily, um, luckily there is a leather shop in the area. I'll do a quick pitch for Tandy, Tandy Leather. Um, they, they're one of the larger um, leather suppliers, and they actually operate out of an old mill building up in Chelmsford. So, um, a lot of the leather I get there. I've also actually gotten leather at the at the Brimfield antique mm -hmm, show, mm -hmm. where you, you, you do have you do have people selling selling leather pelts mm -hmm. at the antique show, so I, I, so I'll get it there as well. Um, and if the if the if you're lucky enough to have the original leather pretty much intact, uh, you can make you can make a pattern um, out of the original leather and um, for cutting the new leather, but. In general, after doing a few of these, you get, you get an idea for um, how much slack you really need to leave in the leather when you apply it. For example, for a, for a bellows like this, what you would do is, when, when, the, um, when the bellows is fully expanded like this, you typically, um, you typically want the leather to be fairly taut. So that's, so that's really a good way of making your own pattern is you know, you move it to the extreme position. You you provide you provide a little bit of slack in the leather, but not too much. And and that's the right, that's the proper um, right that's the proper way to um, to to cut out the um, the material that you need um, to make the to make the bellows work. So, did you have any challenges um, getting it to conform, leather to conform in in, in shape? Um, no, 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 not really. It pretty much, um, you know, it'll pretty much conform naturally. One thing, one thing I think that you see old manufacturers doing is I think they sometimes they would use irons in order to in order to crease the leather, mm -hmm. and, um, in, in order to get it to fold properly. But um, but in general, in, in general, you really don't need to do uh, too much to it. It'll, you know, over time, it'll naturally fold into the proper shape and, and maintain, it, maintain the proper shape. Another question from the stream. Yep. Uh, where do you find the old vacuums? Do you hit up flea markets a lot or is there a market on places like eBay? Um, well, so one, one of the big sources is eBay. Um, having eBay out there has definitely made things much easier since some of these vacuum cleaners have, have even come from overseas uh, through, uh, through eBay. And, um, but, um, 
you know, there are other, there are other uh, ways to locate them as well. There are other online auction shops. There are online estate sales. So typically what I'll do is um, use automatic search engines to, on these different sites in order to send me email and alert me. You said you were a hardware guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it alerts me when a, when a new vacuum cleaner becomes available. And I also have, a, have established a little bit of a network with antique dealers, which mm -hmm. is something that is typically done where mm -hmm. if you know other antique dealers. Good business. You say, you know, they might be looking for a particular kind of item and you're looking for something else. Mm -hmm. And so you keep your eyes open for each other. And, yeah. and, you know, and then you notify, you know, you notify each other when you find something. Yeah. You're a needle in the haystack kind of client. They'll yes. remember you. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> That's so, very um, cool. but yeah, it, I mean, it, it took a while to accumulate all these uh, different ones, but you know, like I said, you just have to you know, keep your eyes open. Yep. Um, one of the things I've appreciated about this process with you is your sense of humor. And I'm reminded of um, when our collections manager and one of our trustees, Dan Eyring, uh, who was your initial yes. contact at the museum. Yep. I think he went out to your house and visited you. He did. And uh, he did. one of the things he said is, I don't know how his wife does it. I don't know how his <laughs> wife puts up with it, that your house is just stuffed with things like this. Yep. Is that true? Uh, unfortunately, yes, it is. Um, <laughs> there are other things that I'm interested in besides vacuum cleaners, other Such things as. that I restore. And so that's, I mean, that's part of the problem is I, I tend to have a lot of different interests. So what are you playing with these days? Where's your attention? Well, my attention these days is mostly on writing software, but um, I do have a number of pieces that I want to get to mm -hmm. one of these days. I have old film projectors. I have old organs that are partially restored. Um, and the, or the organs, by the way, you can get for remarkably cheap because they're, they're so big and they take up so much room that um, people, people are giving them away. Yeah, full-size keyboards. It's like um, yes. no problem finding a piano. It, in fact, I, I have a good story about that. We, we were actually picking up an organ at someone's house that they were donating for free. So we rented a U-Haul and we, you know, my son helped me move it into the back of the U-Haul. And as we, as we were driving away, my son noticed um, a bumper sticker from the, from, from on, on the lady's car who owned the organ that said, become an organ donor. So, uh, <laughs> so that was, um, there you go amusing. again, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, the last thing that is sprung into my head was the, the, the term that I hadn't heard before. I, I can't imagine you coined it because it's, 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 it's got to be something that's been circulating, but mantiquing? Yes. Um, yep. And, so do you think of yourself as a, as a hardcore mantiquer? Uh, definitely, definitely. There, I mean, there's a distinction. Uh, they're, they're the antique people who look mostly look for high-end antiques like, you know, furniture or rugs or, or even artwork. But, um, but the people into mantiques are looking for um, old mechanical pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it could be, could be engines, it could be something like um, pulleys or vacuum cleaners or something like cash registers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, something mechan adding machines, old mm -hmm. manual and mm -hmm. adding machines, just anything mechanical that um, that needs restoration, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people don't either have the time or the skills necessarily to restore these um, mechanical pieces. So therefore, if you do have the skills, it's it's gratifying to get them working back to the original condition. Well, I mean, you clearly have shown the, uh, the, the skills, the, the discipline, you know, the stick to uh, repeat, 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 repeat. I mean, you've done it over and over again. Although each and, one is different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so yes. um, and I find it fascinating that uh, you trained and then worked as an electrical engineer, right? Yes. This is not electrical. It's the opposite. No. It's, it's everything no. but. No, but it's still, it's still engineering. 
And yes. I think, you know, once an engineer, always an engineer. All right, um, so you were, you were okay with uh, physics, you were okay with leverage, you were I, okay I, with... I, I, loved, I loved physics and I actually, science. in college, I actually started off in mechanical engineering mm -hmm. until, um, until, until I, I thought that I didn't necessarily want that as a career and I thought that electrical was a better career choice for me, so, um, but, um, well, yep. Here at this museum, uh, because most of our artifacts are, I think, would qualify as antiques. Yes. Uh, we are mostly mechanical. Yep. But mechanical is forever, if you think about it. And it's not about the materials. It's about the human scale. So we uh, aren't going to be miniaturized ourselves. Yep. And if we're going to have assistance, there's a mechanical component in just about everything, yep. even if there are electronic brains uh, driving that, the process. That's right, and you even have new fields of mechanical, like the nano, you know, the nano machines and what have you, which are, which are becoming big. So uh, it's kind yeah. of boggles my mind. It's that yep. as, as I try to understand things like that, I'm beginning to feel a bit old myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is. I think it is nice. You know, like I said before, with in this high tech world, I think it is nice to sometimes. Just take a break and appreciate the, um, you know, the simplicity and the beauty of some of these older machines, which came mm -hmm. from a simpler time. Mm -hmm. right. so. The expression elegance in simplicity yes. um, comes to mind. And sometimes we do overcomplicate things. That, um, that's true. And, it, and it's, it's um, what do they say? Um, a break is as good as a rest. In other words, if you task switch and do something unusual for you that you don't normally do, yes, um, it it refreshes. You don't have to take a nap it does. to be refreshed. You can feed and rest your mind in other ways and become inspired. I think um, that, I think that's exactly right. You know, you you exercise a different part of your mind that you don't usually get to exercise during your normal work day. That's right. And and. That, that does provide a certain amount of stress relief. No question about it. As well as for the wife, uh, beating the living daylights out of your carpet Just, is a, you know, was put, an excellent stress relief back then. That's right. Put your, or, put your husband's face in your mind's eye or, squarely at the center of that blanket that's or right. carpet. That's right. That's right. I'm sure these did work on husbands as well. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in closing, is there anything else that you ha has popped into your head in the process uh, of, of going through, you know, creating this tech talk tonight that you have left unsaid? Um, no, not really. Uh, as Dan mentioned to me before, before the taping, there was a lot of material that we recorded. Uh, originally, we were hoping to, to include things like um, patent drawings. And even and even ads for the different vacuum cleaners um, in the videotape, but there, there there just wasn't enough time for this presentation to do that. But Dan, I guess uh, uh, Bob, sorry, <laughs> is working. We is, can edit that out. There you go. <laughs> uh, Bob, Bob is working to um, on a more long-term version of the tape, which will include um, things like the patent drawings. Um, and like I said, some of the old ads, which are, which I think are also a fascinating piece of the history of these, and um, some of those drawings I think are already on display with the, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, with the vacuum cleaners here. But but that's another aspect of this whole thing that we really didn't get a chance to to cover today. So um, there's one final question that yep. is a very nice segue from what you just said, and it is, how much longer will the exhibit be available at the museum? Um, well, we don't know when we're going to reopen for a public visitation or in-person visitation, but this exhibit will be up when we reopen. So um, you can count on it uh, at least being months longer than it takes us to um, open our doors again. And uh, I'm hoping that that's the fall of 2021, but I'm not predicting that because who really knows? Um, Tuesday, the Tuesday Tech Talk series uh, premiered this fall. Uh, there have been four so far. Uh, the other three um, are on our YouTube channel. You can find them. Uh, there's a Tuesday Tech Talk playlist. Uh, and as Dave pointed out, um, the video, video editing process I am learning 
and I found it a big challenge to film on Friday and get this ready for your viewing tonight. Uh, and I had to leave a lot out uh, in, just to get it done and tight enough so that um, you know it showed his work well. Uh, but that's been true in each of the three prior talks as well, where we run the live event, but then take the um, recorded feed and then um, improve it, polish it a little bit. And we'll be doing the same thing with this. So if this is something that uh, you want to view again um, in another couple of weeks or so, a fresh version will be up that will include things like patent drawings and some uh, before photos, I believe, yep. that you've shared yep. and, um, and other things. And you may come up with more in the meantime. Uh, and um, so it will be this and more, this and a little bit better. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll, we'll resume yes, thank you. The, the Tuesday Tech Talk series in uh, January. Uh, and we have a few ideas, one of which is three-dimensional weaving. That may take us a little bit longer than January because uh, properly recording and explaining that process um, is going to be challenging. Uh, good luck in the snowstorm. Dave, thank you so much oh, you're for welcome. the time and energy you put into this. First, for the generosity of it, of, 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 of sharing this work with us, but then investing the time after the fact to help sort of pull away the curtain and, and, and show us and explain to us. You gave us such good background. You gave us a, 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 a good view into the, the technology and the trade-offs that they made, what worked better, what worked uh, not so well, and you did it with levity and um, I really appreciate oh, you. Thank I, you. I appreciate it doing it. And that's, I think that's part of the process too, is, is after you're all done, being able to share it with the general public so that they can appreciate it as well. So. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. Yep, thank you. And um, happy new year. Good night.